ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome to the stage, Alan Scally. D.H. Lawrence uh, wrote, those who go looking for love only make manifest their own lovelessness, and the loveless never find love. Only the loving find love, and they never have to search for it. I was the uh, Marco Polo of searching for love, uh, the Lewis and Clark. Okay, that's two people, but all right, I'm a nice bunch of guys who just never know who you're going to meet. So that fits. Um, so this is uh, 1974, and I'm technically living uh, with a roommate in a duplex, but I spend three, four nights a week at my girlfriend's apartment, and she's in the student housing building, classic brick building on the Portland State campus, fourth floor. This particular evening, I'm uh, sitting in the wicker chair looking out the window at the night lights, and they're glittering and really inviting, kind of cold, and the fog is starting to seep in. And Billy, my girlfriend, is listening to the munchkins sing Babylon about the yellow brick road and watching Happy Days with the sound off. And uh, I said, I'm going out. Um, and she looked at me and uh, see I was hip enough to be bisexual so basically what this uh, really meant was I was exploring my alternative sexual identity I was out going to go really uh, allow myself to to become uh, get in depth to myself to my own human eroticism she looked at me oh gonna go suck some cock huh <laughs> and I looked at her and uh, I looked at uh, Happy Days with the sound off on the black and white small TV I bought for her at Sears, and I looked out at the lights, and anyway, I left, uh, and it felt like the lights were cackling with laughter, but uh, Elton John, Happy Days. Uh, I, uh, so the choices for exploring the alternative sexuality I was so intent on was either going to the bathhouse and uh, doing anonymous sucking and fucking, or going to a, a bar and basically having an almost equally anonymous encounter. And that particular night, I decided to keep my <coughs> options open, so I went to the bar. And when I got there, it was so early, everybody still thought they were gonna get laid. It was, <laughs> it was great. It was so early, the drag queens still looked good. I mean, uh, their hair was perfect. and. The mascara hadn't started running, and they were still witty, and I still wasn't gonna go home with any of them. For some reason, they all hated me. I don't know what the deal was, but, so I figured, okay, so uh, not gonna connect with the drag queen, but, uh, you know, I can, I wanna wind up with some strange guy, and we're gonna wake up tomorrow and avert our eyes, and either he'll get dressed and rush off, or I'll get dressed and rush off, and then I'll take Billy to breakfast. This sounds like a great evening. Uh, so uh, I, I sat there uh, drinking, and uh, 2.30, this is, see, 2.30, like the despair starts to set in. The, 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 the reality hits. My mascara is running. I'm drunk. I'm not going to get laid. And around the corner, the after hours bar is about to open. See, there was a bar, this one bar that, and that, not to go into Portland, 1974 liquor laws, but this bar sold hard liquor, and afterwards, the bar that only served beer and wine stayed open, and they served really bad, fresh coffee and fresh desperation, and that's where everybody wound up that wasn't going to go home with anybody. So I went over there, and. Uh, it was kind of this exciting uh, process as a guy came rushing around with a big urn of coffee going, hot coffee, hot coffee, hot coffee. It was like his big moment of glory. And so I went in there, and there's the table. It's got the silver urn, the styrofoam cups, and a bunch of us losers standing around going, no, oh, this is really good, okay. And so if you're really smart, you had, take, you had a small pint of whiskey, and you poured some of that god-awful coffee, went into the restroom, poured it in the toilet, put whiskey in your styrofoam <laughs> cup, and went back out, even though the whiskey that I could afford tasted about as bad as the coffee. Okay, no problem. So anyway, 
I'm there, I'm looking around going, oh, well, you know, it's only 2.30, I could still go, go and knock on Billy's door and say, hey, honey, I'm home. And I remembered how thrilled she always was to be woken up at three in the morning by a drunken, a horny boyfriend who had been God knows where. So I thought, no, no, okay, this is, uh, bah, let's think about this for a second. So anyway, this, uh, there's this guy there. He's uh, kind of Eurasian, got this uh, long, glossy black hair, and he's got this uh, sort of a kimono kung fu outfit on. And the song that's playing, of course, is Kung Fu Fighting. You know, you remember? Everybody was kung fu fighting. It was a little bit frightening. And the guy's doing this punching and this kicking. And he's just really into this. And I'm watching this going, oh, yeah, this is pretty interesting. Oh, God, this is interesting. What, what's happened to my life? But oh. uh, So anyway, I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, OK, so what do you do, and where do you go when morning comes around, and kung fu fighting no longer plays, and T-Rex is coming down? So but he, you know, I don't know. He kicks, and there's this poor, really drunk guy standing uh, leaning against the wall, and he kicks a styrofoam cup of coffee out of this guy's and it goes up in the air. And the guy is so out of it, he doesn't even look. He's like, oh. You know, just, I was watching it, and the, the liquid spilling. It was kind of like the bone in 2001, Space Odyssey. You know, it goes up. Uh, so we didn't have the uh, musical background that would have been fitting. So anyway, it comes down, and I'm looking at this. And oh, OK, this is great. And this guy is standing, not complaining really a zen-like acceptance of this reality that he's in. And then I saw her standing there. And she was this really young, really blonde, and uh, just looked like she just walked out of the cornfield and was standing against the wall, kind of spread out like this, sort of like a crucified virgin. And I'm looking, and I'm trying to determine, well, let's see, she's either the most skilled drag queen I've ever seen at makeup and hair, or she's a real girl at two, three o'clock in the morning in this place. Okay, with this I gotta check out. So, walk over. And you know, I just always prided myself on the suave, sophisticated nature of my uh, conversational gambits. I went up and I said, hey. And she looked up, <laughs> and she was obviously of the same school, sort of the, uh, you know, Andrew Wolcott, Dorothy Parker School of Wit. She went, yeah, hey. And then I came. <laughs> so, you know, it's, okay, there's a connection, right? So then, it, <laughs> so I go, uh, oh, hey, are you real? And she looked at me, am I what? I, no, you're not a drag queen. Not the last time I looked. Here, this asked this ask my husband. So husband comes over, and he looks like he's an assistant coach at a small town high school foot, uh, for a small town high school football team, and he comes drifting over, and he's like got the muscles, and he's you know real buff, cross crop blonde hair, and their story is they're from, of, of course they're from Montana, uh, yeah they're from Montana, and they came drove down for one night in the big wicked city, they want one night of decadent depravity, and I'm the chosen one. And they're going, I was going, oh, okay, this is, uh, and so we discussed the threesome, and then we're, and it's nice to be, when you stay more than one place, you have these options that are open to other people that stay in one dwelling. Anyway, we're at the duplex, and we're on the couch, and I'm using my conversational skills again, and I'm going, <laughs> you know, it is pretty hot in here. You mind if I take off a few clothes? And so, of course, this is like the basic hint. And so they were, you know, okay, everybody's got clothes up. She's lying on this uh, oriental throw rug. And I didn't even mind the cat hairs then. It was just like, oh, okay, <laughs> which is usually very annoying. But so she's all sprawled out, and I'm looking at her. And this is when I discovered that this guy probably really was a coach. I said, okay, <laughs> you lick her pussy and then lick her butt. Put your finger in. She likes that, okay? And I'm going, yeah, I got the playbook, coach. I worked on it. Yeah. I'm going. I'm going in. <laughs> so and, uh, we're doing this, and, uh, you know, I'm doing the, the oral thing. I'm licking her pussy, and I'm just thinking, oh, she tastes, I thought, she tastes just like the infinite blue sky over Montana. But then I thought I was a poet, too, so that was a <laughs> double disappointment. But anyway... <laughs> 
So everything's going well. She's just, you know, she has these orgasms. And then the next step is supposed to be, okay, then I get on top, I'm supposed to get on top of her and have this incredible sex, but I cannot get an erection. You know, this is because I had been really smart and taken a bunch of really good pharmaceutical amphetamines, drank quite a bit, smoked some dynamite hash, and so therefore, my body is just like, oh yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> We're feeling good, you what is it, go along, do whatever you're gonna do. And so then her husband, with you know, the coach with very experienced hands, turns my head around, inserts his, you know, corn fed penis into my mouth and <laughs> and we start I start sucking and he's got the head, he's going, Yeah, yeah, back and forth, move, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like uh, do you coach a swim team or what? This is really uh, you know, this uh, or or you know, or is man, this is like really bizarre. So anyway, that's fine, but the guy was insistent on holding my head while you know he ejaculated and made sure, you know, oh, I swallowed. Okay, okay, cool. Then we're we're all right then. But you know, the, she started waiting expectantly, but I'm still not getting an erection. So uh, then, basically, with very skilled hands, like he knew exactly what he's doing, he turns me around, enters me from behind, and then while he's doing that, he's telling me how to move, what tempo, and I'm thinking, I'm just glad I never have ever played for you. I mean, God, whatever poor kid out there in Montana is going to have to play uh, football for you. I just, oh, Lord. Uh, when he gets under center, you're going to be telling now. <coughs> so anyway, uh, so she's standing in front of me, and uh, while she's standing there, I perform oral sex. I lick her pussy again. She comes again. He comes and it's, I'm thinking, okay, this is great. This is about my third threesome with a, a, Mary, with a, a guy and a girl, so I should be get, getting pretty good at this. But everybody's coming but me. And there's, everybody is just having a good time, but what's up with me? So we um, went on, and they finally they concluded that I was not going to get an erection. I was not going to get it up. So with, you know, with guys, it was like always sort of, well, this is unfortunate, but you have a, a pair of hands, you have a mouth, you have an ass. We, we, we'll make do. So impotence was never really a big factor in those cases. But she was really disappointed. I mean, they drove all the way from Montana, going to have a big night in a big wicked city, going to have this depravity and decadence, and then go home and talk to God about it or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, but the whole point is it's supposed to be really down, dirty, and horrible, and they're supposed to really be feel guilt-ridden. Ah, okay. I failed them. So um, we, you know, we're doing along, and um, morning's coming, and she's all pouty because she he wound up with, he got on top of, she had to fuck her own husband. So this, <laughs> this was not the finale she was expecting. No, 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 no. This is not what's supposed to happen. They're, they're supposed to be able to drive back to Montana with this little tension. Did you like him better? <laughs> was he better? You know, I, you know the, the dynamic was really becoming clear. So, uh, morning's coming, they're turning down the offer of, what do you want to, you know, sleep? You can use my bed, you can get a shower, I can make breakfast. No, they want to drive back to Montana and argue on the way, and he, he, you picked him. No, you didn't, you picked him. <laughs> so uh, th they're gonna stop at, some, at Denny's somewhere and have this argument, and the waitress is gonna have a story to tell. Oh my God. <laughs> so, but I realize uh, they're going back to their real life. They've got a real life to go back to, and I've got no such thing, no direction home. And I kind of watched them get dressed and get all gussied up and ready to go. And they left, and I never, you know, I never even knew their first names. This was, uh, I look back and I think, you know, it probably might have been polite to know that somebody was named Rod and she was named Galinda or whatever. I don't know. Uh, that's a hidden fantasy of the, uh, the good witch. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> So they left, and um, I thought, I just watched them go, okay, you're going back to your real world, and I'll stay here. My world is just this fantasy. We're you know, a whole set of partners and a girlfriend that barely puts up with my going out all the time. And 
So I thought it just became apparent that my life was like this series of interconnected rooms. And I walked through these rooms, and there was sort of like a light trace of fog. And there was just nothing but a series of naked bodies and callous beds. And it just a fog would get a little thicker, a little thicker. And anyway, I look back, and now uh, basically I'm in one room, and the fog gets thicker, and the ghosts gather. And that's all I got. Thank you.